that's amazing. I'm just getting started. Let's get ready to start. <laughs> All right. So let me make sure that I've got this right. You guys are ready for me to preach right this minute? Yes. Never in the whole time that I've been here has, have we gotten to this point that fast. This is not funny. So I uh, apologize. I thought I had the timing out there. Um, the kids are in there uh, uh, kind of dancing and singing right now. And, uh, so. So I'm in that move, or you know, kind of groove. So you guys ready to kind of dance and sing? And uh, we'll just kind of do that. Yeah. Um, don't know that I can pull that off. I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We uh, we in this winter time have been looking at how does God want us to help you know partner with the Lord and be empowered by the Lord in order to transform the world? Because the world's not exactly speak right now, like exactly the way God wants it. Is that true? You guys know. <laughs> That's right. right. So there's brokenness, there are different things, there are struggles, you know, people that need to be helped. Need to we need to be helped, you know, there's, the there's a lot that needs to be done. And so in that so context, then, um, I'm drawn again and again to a quote, uh, I don't know if this is exactly the way he said it, but I heard him say this in, in kind of the general sense. This guy, Dallas Willard, he's a big time, smart guy, very, very brilliant um, philosophy professor who wrote a lot of Christian books as well. He said Jesus, in his estimation, was the smartest and wisest person ever to have lived. So if we think about that for a second, just kind of let that sink in for a second. The smartest and wisest person ever to have lived. You may say, I don't know. You know, there are a lot of other smart people out there. You know, when you think of these big business leaders or scientists or mathematicians or something, you say, well, is Jesus really is the smartest? Think about wisdom, knowing the right thing to do at the right time. Take that in for a second. Christians, as we engage the Bible, you see Jesus revealed as, as the Word of God made flesh. Which means that the, the wisdom and power that created all this stuff that we're trying to figure out as smart people was already all there in Jesus. So then, if that's where we're coming from, it makes all the sense in the world why we as a church have said we want to make new disciples of Jesus for the transformation of the Christians. Because that means that we're aligning ourselves with the wisest, smartest of people who in his wisdom and smartness decided the best way to do that is to teach people that would then teach other people. He didn't write the New Testament. He spoke it. Told people about how to live. And then they told other people. And so the whole thing is dependent upon relationship from day one with Jesus coming into the world. And so when we think then, how do we want to transform the world? How do we want to help it to be what God wants it to be? As these little imaginary land masses appear on the globe, we're putting different things up there that for Jesus were absolutely essential in his mission of helping to save people lead us to heaven, but not just lead us to heaven so that right now we just say, well, the world stinks and I just can't wait for heaven. There's not much I can do about it right now, um, so I'm just going to kind of watch TV and just kind of wait until uh, uh, the end of the world and then go to heaven. You know? I'm just going to kind of sit around, eat fritos, and, you know, wait for the end of the world to come, you know. No, 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 Jesus is like, no, I have things in here to do, good works that you were created to do. But Jesus then helps us to do them in very particular ways. Last week we talked about friendship sharing our stuff and our things and our money and with people in need and how to kind of wrap our mind around that. And now we're going to look at, at this whole idea of small groups because it's really, really strange. Jesus could have been like the Lone Ranger type of person. He could have been kind of like, you know, the, the dirty, hairy kind of cop where I don't need anybody. I'm just going to do it myself or, you know, um, could have been like that. But that's not what Jesus did. So before we get into the scripture passage, I want to just kind of rewind. A lot of you may not know this whole story of Jesus and how this happened. Some of you know it really well. But this whole idea that um, the Word of God becomes flesh to show us how to live and to show us what God is like and to redeem us and save us. So, you know, but, but for 30 years after Christmas, after that first Christmas when Jesus came into the world, we don't know, you know, he was just kind of growing and learning. He was just, just kind of this average guy on one hand, although I bet his classmates were like, Dude, he is really smart. He always seems to know what, you know. And then his Bible class, you know, is probably top of the heap, right? 
probably knew, you know, learned the Bible really, really well. So, you know, there were probably things that people were like, wow, he's really unique. But he didn't become public and start doing big time miracles until around 30 years old. When God impresses upon his spirit and on his strong, very spirit, now's the time. And so he starts then to become more public. As he does that, he goes out into the wilderness where John the Baptist is baptizing people in the river. Way out to the wilderness. And so Jesus is like, okay, we go to him, led by the Spirit to go to him. And as he's baptized, he comes up out of the water. God indicates through voice and through um, seeing the Spirit of God kind of come upon Jesus that this is the Son of God that God loves. Now he's public, at least to that little band of people that are undergoing spiritual revival out in the wilderness. Those people now know, hey, Jesus is a big deal. This is really important. So what are they probably going to do? They're going to go get their friends and their family and say, hey, uh, we heard the voice of God and the Spirit of God coming down on this guy. Would you like to see him? And everybody's going to be like, well, yeah, I'd like to see that. So Jesus, instead of becoming a real popular guy right then, he's led into the wilderness by that Spirit that now somehow comes even more upon him. And he's tempted by Satan out in the wilderness for 40 days by himself. Now, when you're alone, some of us may really love that and kind of feed off of that, but if you're alone for day after day after day after day, life gets a little difficult, right? And it starts getting challenging. If you haven't eaten, if you're fasting by yourself, which is what Jesus did for 40 days, folks, I get cranky if I miss one and a half meals, right? And some of you guys are like, yes, you know, if I miss two meals, watch out, you know? Well, let's now, so he's by himself out in the wilderness. It's, it's difficult. What a perfect place for him to be tested by Satan. Hey, if you don't want this, you got to do something else. And so he overcomes those temptations. He passes the test. Now Jesus is ready to become kind of this public figure and do things that no one's done before in certain ways and miracles and helping people to share radically and love each other. And so now he's ready to do that. And again, if this was an American movie, he'd probably be like the, the lone, you know, hero. You know, I don't really need anybody else. Everybody's going to come to me and be like, oh, what a wise man. You know, like, yes, I am, all by myself, right? But instead, Jesus does something very different. And so, birth, 30 years of kind of growing up behind the scenes, becomes public in his baptism, goes by himself in isolation of eternity. What does he do next? Go listen to Mark. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Okay. Smartest, wisest person in the world. And right after going through that temptation, and now he's ready to do his ministry, what does he do? He puts himself in a relationship with these four guys. Seriously? Because, I mean, friendships are great, but it also is obligation, right? And um, Peter, James, John, Andrew, um, some of them had some struggles with Jesus and let him down, didn't they? So, I mean, you would think that Jesus would have saved himself the trouble of worrying about that, but he didn't. He leaned into relationship with people and specifically and intentionally called them together to follow him. Now, that's an interesting thing because if we then are disciples of Jesus, we're saying Jesus' way is the smartest way for us to live. It's the wisest way for us to live. Then it's unavoidable that this whole group commitment and commitment to people in that deep relationship stares us in the face and says, this is important, this is essential. If we're going to transform the world and be transformed ourselves, we can't get around this because this is what Jesus did. 
So we had those four, then added another eight. And four plus eight is? Twelve. All right, yeah, yeah. Four plus eight is? Okay, see, you learned something today, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, but then, it, you know, Peter, James, and John, those were kind of like his top three that, that he um, did even some more discussion with. So he's got the 12, and he's got this little micro group of three. Um, and, but then he preached to thousands. And other times it was like 72 that he kind of taught and then sent out. But he always returns to these 12, and the three within the 12, again and again and again. And it's intentional, and it's sacrificial, and it's painful, but yet it's wonderful in the end. So the first idea of intentional. The, the choir, the, part of the message of that song was as, as Jesus intentionally came in, they responded, like, bravely. And they, they were like, okay, we're in this movie. And that ended up costing them their lives eventually in human terms, but then they got to be in the presence of God in heaven directly. So they, they didn't really lose anything. They gained everything. So it's this mutual relationship. Jesus says, I want to be in a relationship with you, a friendship with you, and, but, I, but it's going to take you being a friendship with me, which Judas eventually said, no, thank you, right? And some of us may have that, have that happen to us, but, but somehow then you've got those intentional relationships. But it was also sacrificial. There's a part in the Bible that says that Jesus emptied himself to come to us and be human. And that makes sense. If I'm the creator of the universe, and then I've got to become something where I'm hungry and where I have to have sleep, you know, and where I'm going to be tempted like every human is, that means that I've gone from like king of the universe to now like the slave of my body and stuff, right? I mean, that's emptying himself, but he did that for us. Then he dies on the cross. And on the cross, you remember, he says to the, the people there, I forgive you, my father forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Whoa, radical sacrifice. So that in itself had to be painful physically as well. So it's the whole idea of I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to wash the feet of the disciples, I'm going to serve them. I've gone from king to slave. I've gone from kind of president to servant. And that's sacrificial and it's going to be painful. This intentional relationship. It ended up costing him his life. But it was worth it because there was a wonderful end. <coughs> so this whole idea that it is painful. And that, that passage, Matthew 4, he knew that when he said, come and follow me, Simon Peter. Come and follow me. He knew that it was going to be extremely painful, and yet he was willing to do that. And so as you think about that, then, I've thought, hmm, you've heard me say this before, see if you remember this, the whole idea of painfulness. Now let's talk about heaven for a second. Because the pain we endure, we can endure if we have that internal perspective and say it's going to be worth it long term. But the pain that I'm enduring for myself, and the reward for myself, but also that I'm helping other people in that relationship, worth it for us to invest in those relationships if they do that benefit of heaven. But in heaven, if we haven't dealt with the pain of forgiving people and having our hearts transformed now, imagine what it would be like to look into heaven and see people that may have hurt other people or may have hurt us, but because of the grace of God, they, they really embrace God's forgiveness and now they're in heaven. And so we're on the outside looking in and we see people that have hurt us or hurt other people and now we've got a decision to make, don't we? Do we really want to be with them forever? I do, but I'm going to have to have to forget them. And so think about that for a second. Because normally when we think about heaven, we think about, you know, hey, great grandma's going to be there. And she was awesome. And she cooked pies for me. And she cooked, oh, I wish grandma's noodles and her rolls and the roast beef dinners. Oh, Lord, can't wait to get to heaven and be with her, you know, again and stuff. And that's awesome and that's good, you know. I mean, by all means, you know, having this relationship restored and that she loved the Lord and she's there with the Lord. I can't wait for that. But there may also be that kid that picked on me and spit in my face in sixth grade, he may be there too. Because he may have gotten a hold of Jesus. He's got a hold of him. He loves people now and, and then I'm going to see Chase. That was the kid's name in case you wondered. I'm going to see Chase there. Do I want to be with him forever? And God's going to be kind of like, hey, you know, Pray in that Lord's Prayer, forgive me as I forgive others. <laughs> How's it, you know, you got to forgive man? So in a group setting, when you're in a relationship with people intentionally, we'll hurt each other sometimes. We'll have to forgive each other. We may get on each other's nerves. But this is wonderful practice for heaven. To say, you know what, I'm being formed and I'm being forgiven. If 
my heart's being changed to be loving and forgiving. Because that's where I want to be forever. That's what I want to be like forever. And so God gives us that opportunity now to start to, to have that opportunity to be, to taste it a little bit, taste it a little bit, and then in the resurrection of the time, to be able to fully be there. So let's talk about the wonderful side of being in that relationship and commitment to some group of people in some way, shape, or form with Jesus. And the whole idea then, reconciliation between me and God oftentimes happens because of friends that have helped me. People that have said, here's what worked for me. Here's how much God loves you. Here's who you are in God's sight. I have a friend that is passionate about reminding people of who they are when they love Jesus. You're a child of God. You're a brother or sister of Jesus, and you're my brother or sister, and you're uh, like a co-inheritor and ruler of the earth because the Spirit of God is within you. And man, when I'm around him and I leave, then I'm like, heck yeah, I can make it through anything, right? Because the friend has helped the point to who we are, that reconciliation between God and us, and then also that help of each other. You know, when we read in the New Testament, there's, there's early Christians that were following Jesus as example, and they didn't give up meeting together, they supported each other. It says at one point, no one was in need around them. Because they were sharing, they were caring for each other. And emotionally, they were there for each other. And then they saw the power of God work so mightily among other people that they were ministering to, that they saw really, really bad people receive forgiveness and become very loving people. People like Paul that were you know, almost like a, a terrorist to the Christians have his entire life turned around. And that, that relationship with Jesus, and then he got to offer that to the people he was in relationship with, the friendship. And so this whole idea that as we commit to some kind of small group kind of an experience, it may look different for different people, but the idea is that you're committing to one another, saying, you know what, no matter what, we're going to try to support each other, be there for each other, reconcile with God and with other people. Now, there are some of you that are in, in um, groups in such a way that that really is a kind of a powerful experience. Ryan, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to come up here and talk to me about your group in a second here. So as he makes his way forward, um, there are different ways that we could do this, right? And you may already have groups like this. I was talking with somebody um, whose parents go here, and she said, you know, back um, when my parents were like my age or younger, they had a Sunday school class that they met with all the time. And then they would go out and have dinner together sometimes, and they would do things together, and they would, you know, um, cook, so you know, do different things together outside of the Sunday school class, but that was like their weekly routine to come and study the Bible and teach and worship. And she's like, you know, that's like what we're doing now, right? I mean, we're trying, but it's hard in today's society. We kind of struggle. Um, but Ryan is uh, in the midst of a group. I think I got a microphone for you. Did you guys say hi, Ryan? Hi, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan, what would you like for uh, what would you like for Christmas next Christmas? Another championship? Another championship. That's <laughs> it. I was going to try to get them to give it to you, so I get, you know, I don't know, pray for them, and I guess no. And I love it, I love it. Um, I, the, the life group that you're a part of, um, that's one way to kind of live this out. Uh, when do you guys meet? Where do you meet? And kind of who shows up for that? What's that look like? So currently we meet on uh, Sunday nights at. Uh, Brandy guy at house, she's our leader. Uh, she's graciously, graciously taken our uh, small group of bandits in. Uh, and uh, we meet from four to six, typically the first half hour or so, we do some snacks. Uh, we kind of take turns on who's bringing snacks and stuff. Um, depends on the person, if you want to keep it simple, just some fruits and veggies and chips and stuff, or if you want to go for a full dinner. So it just depends on the person, what you feel like bringing. Um, but uh, four to six, and then normally the last hour and a half, we're doing some kind of uh, Bible study or um, study on something to do with whatever's going on with the sermons and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it just depends on the week and what's going on. Is it only men, only women, only adults? What, what do we kind of make up? Uh, we've got uh, several families that have small children. Uh, Brandy's sister actually runs a little children's group that. Uh, they do their own little uh, Bible study thing while the adults are doing theirs, so the kids have something to do. Um, and they uh, have meet down in the, the basement and 
so they're studying what we're studying, so it gives the adults a chance to kind of have a breather and, and be away from the kids and to study and to really be able to get into it, and also gives the kids a chance to get into it. So the kids have become really close, as adults have become really close, and uh, kind of uh, an accountability type group. We kind of can tell now when somebody's having an off day, something's not quite right with somebody, and we're able to kind of coach and support and help them and, and really help them to um, get through some of those difficult times. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, so I think I can kind of see between the lines of how you might answer this, but if you were to say, um, here's how God seems to be working in our group. Um, I, you hit on some stuff probably already, but how would you kind of frame that? Because that's kind of a different way to say stuff, you know, and not terminology we always use, but how would you answer that question? I mean, I know for me personally, it's um, I look forward to the group. I enjoy going to it definitely. It's uh, it's one of those things that we don't have it, we definitely miss it. Um, we uh, met for the last two or three months. We're kind of taking a break here for January um, with the holidays and everything over, so we're just kind of taking a breather. But it's I definitely look forward to going to it. Um, so we all really enjoy each other's company and the time that we spend together, and um, it just it's kind of that extra push and drive to help get you through the week, um, kind of gives you that extra boost of, of God to help you see through the week and, and see through some of the craziness and the other people that you run into. Uh, the, uh, we try to do different outreach stuff. We did uh, shoe boxes for, I forget what it's called now, but Operation Christmas Child, thank you. Uh, did shoe boxes for some of the third world countries. We went to the Ronald McDonald House and, and toured there. Um, so different stuff like that, and I said we, we try to really help and support each other as much as we can. Um, whenever we realize that somebody's having a bad day, or if they tell us they're having a bad day or a bad week, and we try to um, help give each other some good ideas on how to get past it. I love, I love, I love it. Um, but you guys, I, I don't know how you'd like to say thank you. Do you say thank you or you could clap for them or whatever? Would you just press a thank you? So his group's kind of packed already, and then it's at that house. So that's why we're starting to you know, kind of start new ones as well. And um, so you might say, well, okay, um, I want to jump in right now. You know, you're like, okay, I'd like to try this in an intentional way. Uh, if that's you, a couple of different things. Um, one, on the next slide, uh, it works right. Um, there are a few different um, opportunities that I wanted to mention right off the bat. Right after the service, um, there is a hallway that goes this way on the other side of this wall. You get x-ray vision goes that way. It's the first room on the right, 117. You gather in there, and there's a guy, Fritz, who's um, really learned a lot of different things about uh, Christianity, history, all kinds of stuff. Is there, if you, that's kind of something you'd like to dig into and try. Right now, you're like, hey, I want to go meet some other people and stuff. Then, um, then you're welcome to do that. Um, a different option would be today at 4. We have um, the next of our classes when it comes to joining the church or just becoming a friend of the church or knowing what's going on. And the way that I'm going to do that today and next week, so kind of tasting the small groups, is to do it in such a way that it's kind of like a life group and how that would work and what that would be like. And so, uh, so some of you wanted to jump on that anyway, and now I just want to make it kind of a little broader. So if you wanted to come back here at 4 and we'll have some signs where to go. Or at Wednesday. Um, Brother Steve over here. Hi, Steve. Uh, he and some other friends gather and uh, have a life group there where they're doing some things over the next couple of weeks that will make it very, very friendly to the new folks to come and so they meet in the fellowship hall. And so he has said, you know, for this two week window, the hazing that they typically do for new folks won't happen. You don't have to worry about it. It's very easy to do. Oh, they don't do hazing. Don't worry about it. But, um, but it's a cool kind of multi generational group of folks that come and care for each other and pray and talk about um, uh, very, very deep uh, ideas of the spiritual growth. Um, now, there are going to be many other opportunities in the weeks to come. Many in the homes. I've got uh, three different families that I'm working with that have already said that they want to, to try this at, at homes. I haven't followed up with them yet. I'm going to uh, very, very soon here. So if you want to jump in that 
and say, you know what, in my workplace, uh, or in my home, or, um, I don't know, some other place around, maybe to the church, or maybe somewhere else, you'd like, I'd like to try to invite some friends together to try whatever this is that you're talking about. So, I'd like to, to try that. If that's you, then on your green um, insert in your bulletin, write post at the bottom on one of those sides. Post, H-O-S-T. Um, that way you don't have to lead it. I'm helping with that. Um, but uh, there you go. Now, as you're processing all that, here's a, one final thought. And it's kind of astounding to me. There are people in this part of town that desperately need your friendship. Desperately need your friendship. And for some of you, you're like, yeah, of course. For others of you, you're like, wait, you don't understand. I've never really had a lot of friends who have around or whatever. I don't, I don't care about your past. I guarantee you, if God's working in your heart and life, there are people out there that need your friendship. And there are maybe new people that you haven't met yet that you need in your life and you didn't realize it yet. And so that is awfully encouraging say, as we try to transform the world, we are going to be friends to people who need us, and we're going to receive friendship from people that we didn't even know we needed <coughs> until we see them face to face. We're like, oh my gosh. And so I'm going to pray for all of us in that, because that kind of thing transforms the world. God, thank you that you have given us an image to follow in Jesus that will help us to find the people that need us, and that will help us to be found by people that we need. And so help us in these coming weeks as we partner together to do what you've envisioned that we can do.